Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. I want to thank our underwriter who makes this program possible, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. I'm happy today, I'm really excited about our book because it is a book, well, you've heard of books about books. This is a book about book covers, and it is beautiful. It is a gorgeous book. You're going to want this. I'm also excited because um, this book, by the way, is Classic Penguin, cover to cover, and I have with us today uh, two of the top professionals in the publishing industry. We have Elder Roeder, who is the vice president and publisher of Penguin Classics, and Paul Buckley, who is the premier, uh, well, actually, he oversees, he's a premier creative director, but uh, he has the challenge of overseeing a diverse group of designers and art directors, quite a job, uh, who create exceptional book covers. And so we're going to be talking to them about this this particular uh, project that they have completed Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you all today? Very good. good. Thank you. How did this come about? Well, this year is the 70th anniversary of Penguin Classics, and we thought it would be a really great way to celebrate our visual history in terms of the work that we've collaborated on and worked on with Paul Buckley and his group and the artists that he's brought into Penguin Classics. So it's a showcase of all the incredible work, the covers, the stories behind the covers, and Paul's edited and introduced it. Well, I tell you, I got this book last week, and I have just been mesmerized by it. And not only me, my wife has taken it, and my teenage kids have taken it. And uh, <laughs> you need three copies. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. One of my one of my my teenage sons was looking at the uh, the illustration for the book on Satan, and uh, what's the name of it? I forgot. Um, Oh, oh, it's, yes, I know. The Case Against Satan. The Case case Against against Satan, Satan. He was looking at that and he said, he said it's sick, which, you know, in teenage talk, that's, that's cool. that's good. That's good, yeah. (laughs) The highest, highest We want this book to be sick. (laughs) Yeah, the highest praise. But what what I loved about it was, you know, for one thing, when I get a uh, review copy, I often write all in it, you know, for, for commentary. And this one, it would be sacrilege. I, I can't write on it because it's so visually beautiful. but it, And horrible, too, because you have this horror section that's just, just magnificent. Uh, but the other thing I think that uh, is particularly wonderful about it is that you have the backstory of all these things so that the stories behind them are equally mesmerizing, I think. So I want to make sure we talk about, about those. For instance, uh, let, let's first begin with how did the, the and this is going way back, but how did the Penguin logo come about, the original Penguin? Penguin. I think, well, Al, did you know that story? Um, I know, I mean, it was from the very beginning was even about, like, what should the logo of Penguin mm-hmm. be, right? And I think it was Alan Lane and um, the original designer. Uh, I think it was his assistant, assistant and who yeah. went to the zoo. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then Jan, Jan Chickold sort of, I think, refined it from uh-huh. there. Or some, you know, some close enough to that story. Well, it's yeah. got to be. But there was a zoo visit. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be one of the most uh, recognizable logos in the world, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And huge brand recognition. Oh, yes. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, it's something like 80%. At some point, the, the company did do a, a bit of a study on it. Um, it. It has huge worldwide recognition. Yeah. Internationally, too, it's certainly been recognizable in terms of hand-in-hand with education, hand-in-hand with mm-hmm. people's first experiences reading books. Has There's always been a Penguin Classic there. I, I can never see Penguin Classic without thinking of Woody Allen's famous short story, The Horror of Mensa. Mm-hmm. Do you know that story? No. No? no. Well, briefly, the idea was a, it was a group of intellectual prostitutes who you could hire for an hour of good chat. You know, you could talk about... <laughs> 
you could tell us about Proust or Yeats, and uh, and uh, and they were busted. And finally, the ring was busted, and they were in the back of a college bookstore. No makeup glasses, uh, no no makeup glasses, and leafing through Penguin classics. Great. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, anyway, let's let's go to some of the particular stories because the stories behind these are just magnificent. Let's deal with uh, the Huckleberry Finn uh, illustration or cover because uh, that one won an award, right? For yeah, Society Illustrators Gold Medal that year for Edward Kinsella. It's a, they don't give many of those out. It's quite an honor. I love that cover, and I love the description of of the cover itself uh, about how the viewer is brought in to um, kind of experience the um, the intimacy between Huck and Jim as they go down the river, but we're also uh, brought in as a viewer of the romance of the journey through the illustration. It's just magnificent. Yeah, he, he went and visited caves, and which we, uh, you know, provide photos of. He, mm-hmm. he really did his research. He went to the he went to the site. He said or that the fictional site. Yeah, he said that uh, taking the photographs. I hadn't thought of this that uh, that this would be part of the process for an artist to go out and take photographs. And so, tell me about that. How, how did he come to do that work that way? Well, I mean, everyone's every artist is going to be different. Some are, are so loose that they wouldn't actually want that much source material because it would sort of bind them up. But uh, Edward is a Midwestern uh, fella, and uh, he is... I mean, I don't want to call him a realistic artist because he, he does something that sort of warps the figures and, and makes them all his own. But he... If you look at the areas where he does flesh, like the face and the hands, uh, they are highly rendered. And uh, I think he just really got into this project. And uh, we were just as surprised as anyone when he said, hey, I went and visited those kids. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> I like that he said that the, I don't know if I'm using the, if I'm using his words, but he, he said in the cave, or the illustration of the cave of uh, Becky Thatcher and Tom Sawyer in the cave that he has the the black lines along the cave wall. And he said, I wouldn't have thought of that had I not taken the picture. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The really beautiful um, sort of lucky little moment there. Yes. What about the, there was one uh, that is about uh, the horror stories of the Gaslight era or something like that, the... The title, where the penguin logo is being stolen. Oh, that's a great one. That's one of my favorites, the Penguin Book of Gaslight Crime. Uh huh. <laughs> I I bought that last night, by the way. Oh, great. <laughs> because because of that, and indeed the the book is more than a, a compendium of great illustrations and covers. It is a reading list. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Paul can talk about the story about that cover, because that actually influenced a couple of other uh, classic crime covers that we've, we've done. But in, in terms of how the book is useful, it definitely is a companion to what you should maybe consider reading next, because you see these covers and they remind you of how the depth and breadth of Penguin Classics kind of crosses all these interesting genres. And, and we've given you these new editions, so they should, certainly can be found in bookstores and, and ready for you to read. How do you decide... What will be a Penguin Classic? Well, it's a combination of things. I um, feel that, you know, we definitely have the great opportunity to publish important authors who are already part of Penguin, such as Arthur Miller and Shirley Jackson mm-hmm. and John Steinbeck. Um, but then we also think about the zeitgeist. We think about what professors are teaching, uh-huh. um, what students, what what is important themes or issues that they're being taught right now or want to discuss, and make sure that we have classics for that or we seek new classics out. And then we're dedicated to world literature, so new translations, um, bringing in authors. For instance, we have the first Korean classic ever in Penguin Classics, the story of Hong Gil Dong in a new translation, and it's never been part of our series before. And we delve into fun areas like fairy tales, which are always, you know, incredibly favorite tales from many, many of our readers, and um, bring it all together under the series. And how many, what are the best-selling Penguin classics today? Well, I think for, usually we see a lot, a lot of people coming to um, big classics for us, which are Of Mice and Men, The Grapes Mm -hmm. of Wrath, Mm -hmm. 
definitely Death of a Salesman and The Crucible. Certainly Robert Fagel's translations of The Odyssey. Mm -hmm. I think um, there are exciting new works that we hadn't had in the program before that are of interest or, you know, translations that we've had now have beautiful packaging, one being The Master and Margarita, uh, which is uh, translated by Pazir and Volokonsky. And in this edition that we've just published this year, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous package and was shared everywhere on social media when it first came out. Paul, what is your uh, favorite, if there is a favorite, or maybe two or three favorite cover designs? Well, to echo what Alda just said, I, I'm really uh, very much in love with Master and Margarita uh, cover uh, by Chris Conescu. Um I'm a big fan of our uh, Kama Sutra, and I, I love our new series oh, yeah. uh, coming out great. this fall. Oh, yeah, you can talk about that, right? <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Did I make you blush? <laughs> oh, I tell you. And that is uh, the, the very picture of creativity. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> on many levels on many <laughs> levels on many many levels that is just wonderful but also the story behind it because he said that he had tried many times and and uh, and you kept saying that's not it yeah malika um took it a, ma- a, a matter of french pride to because <laughs> I, I think i called her a prude uh, an american <laughs> French illustrator approved. She uh, <laughs> she went back, and I think she tried to shock us, and she was probably shocked when we got back and said, "Yes, this this <laughs> thank you. This goes just far enough." <laughs> I love it. It is it is just a gorgeous gorgeous cover. Yeah, the, she's a super talented. So so uh, what's so what is the process? Uh, I mean, how does this? Let's suppose that I'm an illustrator, and you decide that that I might be the person who can do this, uh, or do I submit? to you ideas that I have for for that book and you choose among the illustrators? Well, how does it work? No, we, we, we don't work like that, though. I mean, artists often do submit to me um, covers that they just redesign or mm-hmm. on their own, and, and which is amazing because it, it helps us see what they might do on a project. But no, it, it's, it's really... Um, I'm looking all the time, and there's many. Pro- I'll just, I'll just got a lot of projects going, and and we're looking to put covers on them, and we're we're just always looking around. And artist submissions come in the form of it could be an email, it could be a mailer, it could be something I see on the street, it could be movie trailers, uh, it could be something I see in a magazine, on other book covers, on on music packaging. Uh, just always looking around. Um, and, and we create just archives of great artists that we want to work with. So it's about matching uh, the voice uh, of the material to a, a contemporary artist of the time who also has something in their voice that will be in common with the material and will just move it a little forward in time. How do the Penguin Classics get put into these categories? I mean, obviously, horror is easy. But you have, uh, you know, orange, and you have these categories. How how do these categories come about, and and what are the standards for them? Yeah, well, I think that you know my responsibility is how to keep uh, the whole program lively, and mm-hmm. how can we be relevant to a diverse readership out there. So part of that responsibility is focusing on where we can see some promising um, activity over certain you know communities that love books like Penguin Horror or Love Typography, so they might like Penguin Drop Caps, or they're the Etsy crafty embroidery folks, so they'll love Penguin Threads. And um, it's paying attention to people's passions and people's interests and seeing if we can carve from that community some series that would attract them and that they would love to have. Um, It's also producing high-quality editions of works that are, you know, beloved by certain readers, but maybe they yet haven't found a great a series for their books, like Penguin Horror, for instance. Mm-hmm. And now with the sci-fi fantasy readers we want to bring in with Penguin Galaxy and having that opportunity to publish in Penguin Classics books like Dune and The Left Hand of Darkness in 2001 and Neuromancer. I mean, it's almost like gasps from across the office, <laughs> you know, to say, like, not only can I get Dune, but I can get it in this gorgeous, like, typography, beautiful hardcover. And then, you know, we give these ideas of series and we talk, Paul and I talk 
very closely about the look and the aesthetic, and we both are very much aware of the reader. And he, you know, brings it to the table. He matches the hope that we have for a series, and he finds, like, the perfect artist for it. I think you should do the Penguin Lone Star edition. Ooh. You, you, can, do, <laughs> you can do McMurtry and McCarthy, and uh, that'll about do it, those two. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> well, you do have McCarthy, right? Um, the road? Not sure, if we do. No, not random not houses. specifically. Oh, random houses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's random, right? Cousins, yeah. our cousins. Yeah. There is a, a great story, I think, behind the book uh, on being different, what it means to be a homosexual by Merle Miller. That That's a wonderful cover, but it's even a better story is how we got there. Yeah, she, uh, that's, that's Kristen Half, and uh, she worked really hard on that, and I really, really wanted that little rainbow to fly, but I, I can see why, why it didn't. But it, I think it's, it's very tasteful and very to the point, and it's mm-hmm. one of those covers without even seeing the type. You sort of, you know what you're getting, I think. Mm-hmm. I think it, it, it definitely translates across a room. Well, I like it. I like it because it's, uh, it's not exactly a rainbow, but uh, it, it, it hints at a rainbow. Yeah, uh, it's quite simple mm-hmm. and direct. Yes. And the other, and it's interesting to see all the, all the things. I like that you put in here the ones that failed. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. this wasn't quite it. And, it, and so you get a, a kind of artistic, intellectual journey of creativity. Yes. Yeah, we want to show you our failures. We want you to be entertained. Mm-hmm. If you laugh at us and that makes you entertained, <laughs> that's okay by us. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it shows that, uh, you know, great work isn't just like a lot of people think, oh, they just, you know, threw that together out of great talent. And in the first trial, they know. got that, you know. And it's good yeah. to see that it goes through many permutations to get to true, you know, excellence. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, simplicity can be quite hard to get to. Like the one on Malcolm X. That one was, um, you know, the the artist said, I I really struggled. How do you do this? How do you illustrate Malcolm X? Uh, Yeah, that was was Kristen again. Mm -hmm. Um, We like to illustrate Kristen's struggles. (laughs) Make fun of Kristen. (laughs) (laughs) The the one that, um, of course, I have a, background in uh, in Twain. You know, I wrote my dissertation on Twain. And so I, I really appreciated, you know, this history of these illustrations, especially considering that when he wanted to illustrate Huckleberry Finn, he had quite a, quite a struggle with that to find the right person to do the illustrations for the original book. Oh, how interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, uh, I would assume that the artists are aware of, like, what's come before, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think uh, as a group, we're always quite aware of the expectations, especially from experts, especially from scholars who will know even the visual history of interpreting, you know, Mark Twain or John Steinbeck. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also a leap of faith, and what we're grateful for is that Penguin readers are always open-minded. They're always um, willing to see, you know, how do we interpret, you know, Lord of the Flies and then for the next generation, for instance, which mm-hmm. is one of the classics that we're going to be bringing out for the first time from Penguin Classics in the fall. Well, Twain, just while I'm on the subject, <laughs> uh, he said that uh, you should read every classic work a few times in your life because it will always be a different book. So I guess if you are in the publishing business, as you publish over uh, you know several decades, uh, you probably have to reimagine the cover, right? Like you said, for a new generation. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's interesting that you mentioned that because for Middlemarch, which is one of the new beautiful deluxe editions that we have, we have a foreword by Rebecca Mead who wrote My Life in Middlemarch. And actually in her foreword to our Penguin Classic, without me um, encouraging her, she basically wrote about her experience remembering the Penguin Classic she grew up with oh. and particularly remembering the cover. But as a young woman, all she saw was the woman in the front of the painting because she too wanted to break out of her small 
small village, and she wanted to make it big in the city. Oh. But now, as an older woman and as a mother, as a seasoned writer, she looked back at that edition, and she noticed that there were figures in the background that she never saw before. And we hope that, that people have that relationship with covers, that it brings you back to who you are, and, and it makes you kind of like think about what you've been through. And with, with her, it was a level of empathy that she only gained from life experience, and she, in a beautiful way, expressed it by the importance of looking at a Penguin Classics cover. Well, I certainly had that experience looking at uh, Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher in the cave. I said, that is the way that I saw them when I was nine years old, when, you know, wow. reading the book for the first time. That's uh, That uh, struck my memory from many, many years ago and helped me see it as I saw it when I was a child. That's beautiful. <laughs> the... The book, um, Jason and the Argonauts, I, I was uh, blown away because the artist said that she uh, she was, she was knew Greek. She had studied Greek and, and took four years of Greek and, <laughs> you know, when she was in college. And so she reread it in the, in the original so that she could think more clearly about how to do the illustration. We did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really lucky find right there. We were sort of blown away. Uh, well, it goes to show the extraordinary talents of the people <laughs> who you work with, right? Yeah, from Missouri caves to this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is? It, how many are there? If is there a collection of penguin classics? I could buy the whole thing. Could I buy a thousand of them? In yes, the same you form? <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, we are we are thinking about that. We've done it in the past where we've had the ability to buy the full Penguin Class, Classics collection, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the Black Spines and Deluxes, and we have had requests for that, and there's just one buy button for it. So mm -hmm. it's good to hear that you're interested in it as well, because we probably will look further into it. Yes, the... The thing that's happened to me recently, I was one of the original adopters of the Kindle, you know, before it worked really well. And I, it's one of the few things that I have discovered, or, or at least in the early days, discovered I was ahead of the teenagers on. You know, I was into that technology before they were. And, uh, and, I, and I have enjoyed it. It's a different platform. It's a convenience, as you well know. But over the past few years, I have begun to miss the beautiful aesthetics of the book. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing them there on the shelf, you know. And, that, and so when I see your Penguin Classics, I think it would be nice to have them all. <laughs> you know, just sitting well, I, there in the library, you know. That, that's part of the goal here. I mean, you can buy, you can upload on, on your Kindle a, a, a more affordable version of, mm -hmm. of many of these books. Um, but, you know, you own a home and, and you want beautiful things and, mm -hmm. and we all want beautiful books. And the, 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 how do you fight against that? It, it's to find those people that actually do and, and to sort of create that want. Um, well, I think maybe on this one I do want this physical mm -hmm. copy of it because, my God, look at that. I, I want to own that. Um, it's, do they it's come no in different. They come in hardback, too? Some. Yeah, some Elder, yeah. do, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Penguin Horror and the Penguin Drop Caps and soon Penguin Galaxy are all hardcover editions. I also just wanted to mention with your listeners that the whole deluxe editions that we do, all of them, have illustrated French flaps and deckled edge pages. So there's like this gorgeous full package to the Penguin Deluxe Editions. Um, and Paul lets the artists go loose on the French flaps. And to me, they're, they're mini art galleries in a sense. I mean, I always look forward to seeing what what is the artist going to do on these French flaps? What are the little portraits or the crazy mentions or themes that they're going to add to it? And when you open up the full cover, it's just a spectacular piece of art. Um, so that in every way enriches a reading experience more than it would be if you had it on a device. Oh, absolutely. And I, I was surprised, actually, at the price of this one that I'm holding the classic Penguin cover to cover, uh, you know, 25 bucks. I, I was expecting it. Before I looked at the price, I thought, oh, this is going to be $50 because it's uh, just so well produced. The production values are, are mm -hmm. magnificent. Did you, but how do you have time for this in the midst of all the other things you do? We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of late nights. <laughs> Lots of late Weekends. nights. Weekends. Yeah. Well, you know, something I've always slightly disagreed with in, in recent times is the idea that uh, 
you know, people say you, you can't judge a book, uh, you know, by its cover. But I, I think in some ways you can because, you know, if you pick up a book these days that has poor production values, you can't help but think, well, you know, the book could be magnificent, but odds are not, are not in its favor because um, it probably was produced by someone who didn't want to put a lot of money into it because they didn't quite believe in it yet, or it was a, it went to a, a press that was, you know, a small press, and they couldn't afford to, to put a lot of money into it. And so when I see a cover that's prof- professionally produced, it doesn't guarantee a great book, but I think the odds are in its favor because some big publishing houses believed in it. That's yeah, what I think. I think. That's- yeah, and I think that's a fair assessment because it is overall a total investment in an author and in a great work of literature. And that's the same to be said for non-classics, for the Penguin books and all the titles that we have under Penguin Random House, that there are these commitment professionals are making around a book to present it in its best light. Let's talk about the horror um, uh, part or genre. Is uh, I would assume that the horror genre would be one of your best-selling it is. It's actually a wonderful new area that I'm delving into, and um, the Penguin Horror series really kind of launched that. And what about, uh, is uh, science fiction closely related to that? Mm. Yeah, I feel it's basically there are two areas where we haven't historically been a leading publisher mm. in terms of providing authoritative, beautiful editions, and now we definitely want to be in these worlds, and we you know, respect the readership who, you know, love these particular works of literature and can't wait to see it interpreted in different mm-hmm. packaging and in different editions. And for us as readers, it's it's so much fun to learn about um, these different genres. There are people that work on our staff who are diehard sci-fi fans or mm-hmm. diehard horror fans, so they're sharing their passions with us. Yeah, where are the millennials in, in their reading? Are they Do they lean toward that science fiction, or is there any way that you can kind of uh, package the youth of America in, in reading uh, content. Well, I can I can safely say that because um, we do have wonderful millennial coworkers here mm-hmm. that their tastes run the gamut. They're mm-hmm. people that love a horror title like Thomas Ligotti's Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grimm's Scribe, which we just put into Penguin Classics. And there are people that love love Ian Forster and Room of a View. So mm-hmm. it's. Um, you know, Penguin Classics is really the face of, of the variety of millennials and people of different generations, um, and they continue to come to different parts. The, the horror is a lively, a lively area for us, the horror sci-fi area, um, and which is why we're committed to doing more fun things for them. I've begun to like uh, science fiction more and more over the, the last few years. I guess it's just a, a, a diversion from what I've typically read, which is a lot of kind of Western-oriented uh, material, or modern Western, what I'd call McMurtry's sort of work, is, uh, and, and McCarthy, too. That's why I mentioned them both. The, um, the, but, but what about in the publishing world in general? Only about three minutes less, I want to ask you, since you all are plugged into it mightily. Uh, what's the future of publishing? The worry has been that uh, digital is going to kill it, traditional publishing, and it seems not to be the case so, but what is what do you guys see as the future? Where are we headed? Uh, I definitely don't think it's dying at all. It's thriving completely. Mm-hmm. I don't think the physical book is going anywhere. In fact, I think that this book, Classic Penguin, cover mm-hmm. to cover, is a testament to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you just have more options, which is kind of nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I often say that that uh, it's just there are different platforms, and, and exactly. it, it gives you more convenience for. Sometimes, if you're traveling, you know, you can take your whole uh, digital library and have choice from 200 books. Or, uh, but when you're at home in your library, it's nice to actually see them there. It's very cool. Yeah, and I see more young people on the subways reading actual books uh, mm. than uh, older folks. Oh, and speaking of the subway, I like that illustrator who did the. Uh, crime book uh, with the stealing of the penguin on mm-hmm. the cover that he did it on Jay the subway. <laughs> yeah. I like that. It's a, just on the way to work, I dashed that off, you know, <laughs> like Lincoln on the train riding the Gettysburg Address, you know. <laughs> well, listen, thanks a lot, guys. I know you have to run. You have many interviews to do, but uh, congratulations on a magnificent book. I love it. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Y'all have a good day.
Thank you. We've been talking today with uh, Paul Buckley and Elda Roeder about uh, their new book, Classic Penguin, Cover to Cover. You're going to love it. Pick it up. For Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong signing off. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. <laughs>